Hi, I'm Dr. Johnson Haas, and welcome to Earth Parts, a free educational netcast bringing geology to all. Another way of classifying igneous rocks is, to me, one of the most important, and that's their chemical composition. What are they actually made out of? What minerals comprise a volcanic or an intrusive plutonic igneous rock? Because they can be very different. And the evidence of looking at something like basalt versus something like granite tells you exactly how different they can be. And so we classify igneous rocks chemically. We do it in terms of what their bulk composition is, and this can be conceptualized in different ways. For one thing, igneous rocks can be considered mafic or felsic or intermediate between the two. What do those terms mean? Mafic, it's a contraction of the words magnesium and iron into mafic. And it's a geological term that applies to an igneous rock that is dense, heavy, and dark. Dark igneous rocks are dark because they contain dark minerals. Minerals that contain lots of magnesium and iron, olivine, pyroxene, amphiboles like hornblende, ilmenite, and magnetite, dark, calcium-rich feldspar. Minerals like that that are dense and heavy and heavy with iron and magnesium. Mafic rocks compared to felsic rocks. Felsic, the contraction there is actually iron, aluminum, and silicon because these rocks are very light. They're light colored typically and they're not very dense compared to mafic rock. Felsic rocks include things like granite white with quartz and types of feldspar minerals, some mica in there. And the iron is not in the same form that it's in, in a mafic igneous rock. In a mafic igneous rock, you have iron in the form of olivine, but the iron is present differently in a felsic igneous rock. It's usually present in mica or other minor or accessory minerals. And you can have rocks that are intermediate in composition between the two. There's a whole range of intermediate compositions that a geologist can assign names to and split up the entire continuum into different particular types of rock. So chemical composition is a fundamental aspect to the designation of what an igneous rock is. And so to describe igneous rocks, you have to look at a couple of different axes on a graph, say. Or you can think of it in terms of two different dimensions. You can think of it in terms of the composition, that is the chemical composition, whether it's mafic versus felsic, versus grain size, which is actually a really good way of designating igneous rocks because the grain size is directly related to whether it is extrusive, it erupted onto the surface and cooled quickly, or if it cooled slowly five kilometers down in the crust and it's got big beautiful quartz and feldspar crystals all throughout the granite or what other kind of rock it is. We can set up an entire matrix and describe what kind of rock occupies that position in the matrix. Where we are, Again, our two dimensions are chemical composition, whether it's mafic or felsic, versus grain size, whether it has big grains because it cooled slowly, or small grains because it cooled quickly. There are also rocks that we call ultramafic, which have even more iron and magnesium than a mafic rock, and they're denser and heavier too, and darker in color because of the minerals that they're made of. You can think of the upper mantle as being ultramafic, a piece of mantle peridotite scoured from the conduit of a lava tube as it rises vertically through the crust. Chunks of mantle can be broken off and they survive the journey and we can see them at the surface and we call them xenoliths. Xenoliths are pieces, chunks of the upper mantle that are embedded in usually basaltic lava that has erupted very quickly to the surface. And they give us a window into what the upper mantle is made of and it's ultramafic. You do a partial melt of an ultramafic rock, 5-10% melt maybe, and you're going to produce a basalt. That's how you make basaltic rock. When it erupts at the surface, it freezes, we have basalt. If it is emplaced in the crust, it's gabbro. What happens then if you partially melt one of those? If you partially melt a gabbro or basalt, then you're going to melt the lowest melting temperature materials in there and so you're going to produce a melt that is more intermediate than mafic. It's closer to felsic. It's intermediate between the two. If it erupts quickly at the surface and forms very fine-grained lava or pyroclastic material, it's typically what we would then call an andesite. Andesite is an intermediate rock type between basalt and granite, and it's from the partial melting of basaltic or gabbroic rock. And so you get a rock type that is a little bit lighter, a little bit less dense. If it freezes in the crust or in other ways cools slowly enough to grow large grains, we don't call it an andesite. In that case, we call it a diorite. Diorite is basically a magma chamber of andesitic material, intermediate material, that freezes before it breaches the surface. Now, what happens if you partially melt an andesite or a diorite? In that case, the lowest temperature materials that come out are mostly silica. 
mostly SiO2, some sodium silicate, aluminum silicate, potassium silicate material, and that forms granite. Granite is felsic because it is the refined partial melt of another partial melt before it, usually, although that can be done in different ways. But you produce a light-colored, quartz-rich, sodium and potassium feldspar-rich granitic rock. If it erupts explosively at the surface, we're not going to call it a granite. At that point, we call it a rhyolite. Rhyolite is volcanic igneous rock that is granitic in composition. It's felsic. It's what happens if a granitic magma body was to reach close enough to the surface that it begins to bubble out all of its gases of CO2, dissolved water, and it's going to explode like a bomb, a very big bomb. Explosive volcanic eruptions are extremely dangerous and destructive. In some cases, a granitic magma can rise slowly enough that it exhales its gases, water vapor, CO2, as it rises through the crust. And when it erupts, it can erupt as a granitic composition, but as lava. In that case, it's a rhyolite lava. It's not pyroclastic. That's usually the case with this composition, but in some cases, you can have a straight-up lava eruption of rhyolitic material on the surface. It's only occurred a few times in the 20th century. It's a fairly rare type of eruption, but it does occur, and over Earth's history, it's built up to be a substantial portion of our crust. If the magma stays down in the crust and freezes solid, then it's a granite. A rhyolite is an eruptive material of the same composition. This refining process was actually studied extensively early in the 20th century by a geologist named Norman Levy Bowen. And his experiments today we refer to collectively as his results of his experiments, what he found, we, re we refer to collectively as Bowen's Reaction Series. Bowen was experimenting with what happens if you take a mafic igneous magma, completely liquid, and allow it to cool slowly. He discovered that a mafic magma, as it cools, it doesn't cool and freeze like water. Remember, different minerals are crystallizing out of this melt, where water freezes at zero Celsius to ice, or ice melts at zero Celsius back to water as the temperature rises. Magma cools over a temperature range. A mafic magma erupts at the surface. A temperature is ranging up to about 1400 Celsius or down to about 1200 Celsius typically. If you have a mafic body in the crust cooling, it'll cool through that range down to our final freezing temperature for the last remaining bits of melt, quartz, and feldspar rich, uh, down around seven or 800 Celsius. And during that cooling process, a series of different minerals crystallize out. This is what we call Bowen's reaction series. Bowen realized that this is essentially what happens in nature when a mafic igneous intrusive body, a pluton of magma in the crust, as it slowly cools, it might erupt originally mafic igneous rock like basalt, but as time goes on and it cools in the crust, where it's coolest is going to be around the margins of the magma chain. And so you'll get minerals beginning to crystallize inward almost like it's, it's a massive geode, although the crystals are, of course, very small. I exaggerate them in the, in the motion graphic I made for this video to get the crystals large enough for you to see to, for visual clarity, but they're just normal grain sizes. But as the magma chamber cools, olivine, the pyroxene will start to plate out over the olivine and around it and with it. As the pyroxene begins to exhaust from the magma, you begin crystallizing amphibole, long spiky amphibole crystals. Along with that later you get a little bit of mica, biotite mica, crystallizing out along with potassium feldspar, and then finally quartz. And when those things crystallize out, they're about the same density as the magma at that point. And so they don't settle or fall out, they actually just suspend in, in the mush, the crystal mush, as it freezes solid into an igneous intrusive body. Mm -hmm.